man, if I want to bench 250 pounds, yeah. I need to start hanging out with guys that bench 250 pounds. Yeah. And eventually, you'll do it. I'm going to level you'll up. Be there. It's on. the same thing spiritually. If you want to grow in holiness, mm. if you want to grow in prayer, if you want to grow in, in godliness and leading your family well, yeah. you've got to surround yourself at least with one, yes. preferably two or three men that are there. Yeah. That you want to level up to. That's yeah. what you need to look for. Yeah. Who are those people in your life that you enjoy being around? Oh, and yeah. they enjoy being around you. Yes, yes. And when you're with them, man, you're becoming more like King Jesus. <laughs> Dr. Williams, so good to see you again, brother. Good to be here, Dr. Harper. Come on, man. I love being with you. Yeah. I think I think you said it best. It's our favorite day of the week. This is the best time. We get to sit here with a friend who edifies, encourages, have a good time, and talk about stuff that matters. Come on. I love In it. a world of of noise where everybody's saying something but not really saying anything at all. That's right. It's good to say stuff that matters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, last week, man, we went in on where are men, mm -hmm. you know, and after thinking about that and after talking with you about that, you know, I really feel convicted that that we need to tell mm -hmm. single moms, women, all those people out there trying to raise young men that it is not a hopeless effort. Right, right. That, that, that God reaches all. And can mm -hmm. reach anyone. That's right. Right? So um, the work you're doing, single mom, the work you're doing, grandma, whoever it is, mm -hmm. in trying to raise up that young man because there's not a male figure present, yeah. that work is a holy and important work. And the Lord will give you everything you need. Let's the go. Lord sees you. He hears you. He knows the struggle. He knows the challenges. And the Lord will give you what you need to, to raise that boy, to raise that daughter, to raise up young men. And I think one of the ways God does this, like we talked about last week, is he brings other people who come alongside you. Especially through his church. Through the church. Right. I have three kids, and me and my wife and I, we're, we're all in. We're trying to do what we can do with these kids. But I am so thankful for the other men and women at our church that pour into my kids, that disciple them, that are running with us. So we, we all need that, whatever your dynamic in the home. We all need that church family that becomes part of our family. Yeah. Now, with that said, I'm still not backing down Yeah. on God is a God of order, mm. and he's ordered things a certain way. Sure. And if you want it to work best, yeah. you got to follow his order. Yeah. And his order is having a, a spiritual head. Yeah. A man they're leading and serving mm. and loving and setting an example. Oh, yeah. And last week we talked about all the crisis of what happens when that's missing. That's right. And, and we said that when spiritual leadership is absent, something else will fill the void. Every when time. biblical discipleship's not there, worldly discipleship steps in. And so whether that's a spiritual leader in the home, the husband, the father, or for the single mom, those are uh, spiritual fathers from the church. You know, Paul, 1 Corinthians, called himself a spiritual father. Yeah. We need those godly men who will lead the family, lead the church, who will step up. And as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, act like men. That's it. Act like men. That's it. And I'm... I'm living example. I'm an, I, I'm an, I am an, a living example of this, mm. right? So I'm a, I'm a functional orphan. I did not grow up with a spiritual father. I did not grow up with a father who was really emotionally or physically engaged. Mm. Okay. As a matter of fact, it was a woman. It was Dr. Ruth Wagner mm. at Bellarmine University. She was the first person to ever really affirm me or wow. encourage me. Wow. I remember I was in public speaking. It was public speaking 101. And she told me to stay after class. Mm. And she said, hey, uh, she said, you have a gift. She said, when you communicate, man, people are locked in. People cool. listen. And she said, I think you just make up most of what you say. <laughs> <laughs> I still love it. She I said, still want to hear it. Listen, this is a true story. She said, have you ever thought about being a lawyer? <laughs> if you're a good speaker who can make up things on the spot, I got a job for you. She I did. see. And she said, um, she said, our, she said, I don't know if you know this, and I didn't know it. She said, our university is the national mock trial champions. We beat Harvard last year. Wow. She said, we loved uh, my husband's the coach, Come on. and we'd love to invite you on the team. I mean, it was the first person to ever really affirm me and encourage me and tell me I was good at something, right? And now you speak for a living. Like Absolutely. you travel around the country speaking all the time because you had this one person affirm you, encourage you, just speak that word of yeah. blessing and encouragement and affirmation to you. That's it. But it wasn't until it wasn't until five years later. So um, I get saved, 
and I, I, I get saved at this large church, right? Mm-hmm. And I know sometimes I can sound critical of the large kind of seeker friendly movement. I pastored a seeker friendly church, so mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not critical of it. I just think critically about things, mm-hmm. but for any criticalness that comes across, I got saved at one of these large seeker friendly churches, there right? So there's some good that yeah. comes out of this. Matter of fact, I'd ask a friend of mine, where does hope come from? And he said, you should come to church with me on Wednesday night. And I said, no, thanks. He said, there's free Chick-fil-A and college girls. I said, I'm in. <laughs> this church was notorious for giving away Chick-fil-A. Forget about hope. Tell me more about these girls yeah. and these sandwiches. And these nuggies, man. Give me these nuggets. <laughs> you asked so, for hope, and he said, look, I got Chick-fil-A, college girls, and you'll get some hope on the side. Come on, let's That's go. That's a good invitation. The side of hope. It worked. <laughs> hey. You went. I went, and I learned, man, that, that not only did I hate God, man, I wanted to be God. Wow. And, and I had rebelled against my creator, and there was a man named King Jesus that paid the price for my rebellion. And when I put my hope and trust in him, man, my life changed, right? Yeah. And it was right after that. Mm. It was right after um, being reborn, being saved, that I met a 70-year-old retired pipe fitter with a sixth-grade education mm. who became my mentor, wow. who showed me what it meant to love God and love others. And I ran with this dude for really up until he died. Yeah. He died about three or four years ago. Mm. But but I would look to him for guidance. And he showed me what it meant to be a godly man, a godly husband. He showed me what it meant to be a godly neighbor. Yeah. He showed me what it meant to to fail and to seek forgiveness and reconciliation. He showed me so much. Mm. And the fact that he was willing to invest that time, the fact that he introduced me to his granddaughter, whom I married. Really? So sometimes you story. find a mentor and a wife. So your friend gave you Chick-fil-A, but your mentor brought you to your wife. Come on. That's let's way go. better. Way better than a spicy chicken sandwich. <laughs> way better, man. But you had. She's kind of spicy, though. I like. I love her. She is kind of spicy. I hope she watches this one. I hope, <laughs> that, I hope that's the only part she sees out of context. No idea what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Just see that clip. But you had, you know, you had that godly man showing you the better way. And that's what we're talking about. If last week we talked about what happens in our churches, families, and nation when that spiritual leadership's not there? Today we're talking about what does it look like when it is there? That's what right. is that better way? What is that biblical example? And you had that. You, you had a man who mentored you. You had a spiritual leader. You had a spiritual father. I had that as well. Uh, not only did my parents point me to Christ, not only did I have a godly father in the home, but when I got saved, I immediately had a mentor, another godly man discipling me. And along the way, as you as well, I know, I've had a lot of men running with me, pouring into me, discipling me. I got a whole list of men on my phone that right now I could call at any given moment and get more counsel, more mentorship, because we we never reach a point where we don't need that. No, and 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 here's the crazy thing. So Don Westfall, Mm. I can name the three men in the last fifteen years that have really like ran with me for a long period of time. That's good. That I looked up to. Don Westfall. Kevin Willier, hmm. Bill Eubanks, right? And because I got it from day one, like literally I got saved and the next day I met Don Westfall, hmm. okay? Because I've gotten it from day one, bro, I thought that was the norm. What I've come to realize, yeah, you and me, we're the exception. Yeah, not everybody had a mentor on day one. Some of them... A year into it, 10 years, 20 years into it, they haven't had that intentional discipleship. And in last episode, we talked about what happens when that's missing. And so today we're saying, let's seek it. Let's find it. Let's be those mentors. Let's find those mentors. I got a buddy named Jeremy Talaferro, and he wrote this short book on mentorship. JT. JT. Find it on Amazon. Jeremy Talaferro. It's a book on mentorship. He talks about the different types of mentors he's had, different types of mentors we need. The one thing I love that he did is he simply sat down and he reflected on who have been the godly men in my life who have poured into me. Come on. And in Hebrews, it tells us to, to think about those who poured into us, to think about the people who passed their faith down to us. Then it tells us to imitate their faith. Let's go. And, and that's part of, I think, why we're saying we need this is because we need those spiritual fathers. We need those mentors, those disciple makers, because we need to be able to imitate their faith. We need to be able to follow their example. We need that pace setter as we're running that we can look ahead to and say, I, I, I want to run like you. I want to run right. with you. But to have that, there's got to be some proximity. 
you know, I think about the Olympics coming up this year, and I, and I love watching the track and field. You get the fastest people in the world in one spot just to see who's fastest. That's like, right. I love that we still do that as a people. We're, we're all working and doing life, but every four years, we're like, I really want to know who is the fastest person <laughs> in the world. world. All of a sudden, that's really important. We used important. to do that when we were six years old. <laughs> yeah. oh, every recess, we'd go out to elementary school, and all the guys would line up and be like, all right, let's have foot races. Let's see who's fastest. Who's the fastest? Even though we did it yesterday. Hey, hey you remember that one girl that could beat everybody? Oh, that was my wife growing up. <laughs> yeah, my, my wife, she's a twin. You're talking about your wife being spicy. My wife is a fast girl athlete. She and her twin sister, they would dominate. Field day, remember field day? All the blue ribbons they just give to the twins over there, and yeah, they would smoke the boys. But we would do it every day, even though we did it the day before. We're like, anybody get faster last night? Let's see. Uh, but I love watching the Olympics, track and field. They're seeing who's fastest, and they do the relay, and it's such a good illustration for what we're talking about. Because in the relay, you got these four men, one team, each run a lap carrying the baton, and then they pass it to the next guy, right? But in order to pass it to the next guy, they have to be close to them. Like, you're not allowed to just throw it to them 20 feet away and That's be like, real. catch, run. That's you got to get close to them to, to make that pass. And, and so if men today want to see the next generation and running, running and stride with them. You get, oh, I you, love that. You can't be out of pace. Yeah, you can't run well, ahead of them. You can't leave visual. them. You got to stay in the lane with them. And so a lot of it, you talk about that mentorship in your life, you just got to have some proximity. Because you, you can't drop the baton. You can't drop the baton. I mean, and right now, we are. Pro. Right? In our we're, nation, we are dropping the baton. We're not even in the race. We're not in We the didn't race. even get invited to the Olympics, bro. <laughs> hey, that's my story. I never get invited to this thing. <laughs> they never think I might be able to contend with these Usain Bolt guys. But do you have... Older men running close with you. Do you yeah. have younger men that you're running close with them? Like every, every Christian man watching this right now, my question to you would be, who are you running with? Who are you discipling? Who are you passing your faith on to? That's, that's so good. So I think this is going to be great. This, this is fire. There, there are two types of men watching this, right? Older men, younger men, mm -hmm. and then everybody in between. Yeah. Right? And old is relative. So yeah, what am I? So, so let's just <laughs> right. So, if you're 18 years old, 28 is old. Yeah. And if you're 28, 42 is old. Mm -hmm. And if you're 75, you're just old. You got everybody. You got everybody <laughs> yes, covered, right? right? I don't know. I, I got a father-in-law who's in his early 70s, but he hangs out with this group of 80-year-olds and 90-year-olds, and they call him the young gun. <laughs> He's the young yeah. gun, right? So that's the secret. Have older men around you, you always feel young. So, so if if you're watching this today as a as a young man, relative, yeah, yeah, and you're saying, man, who's that pace setter? Yeah. And what am I looking for? Let's answer that question. That's if I'm good. a young man looking for a pace setter, yeah looking for someone to follow, first and foremost, and I'm going to mm -hmm. jump in here, you're not looking for the most famous guy. Yeah. You're looking for the most faithful guy. I love that. Faithful over fame. It's faithful better to famous. be faithful uh, than famous, right? I'm not looking for the most successful guy. Now, that guy might be materially, financially, physically successful. I'm not saying right. he can't be. But when I'm looking for that guy to set the pace for me, oh, yeah. man, give me the most faithful guy. I want the guy that's been married for 40 years yeah. faithfully. Yeah, I want the guy that's faithfully served his company for 40 years, right? Yeah. I want the guy that week in and week out shows up at his church and faithfully serves. Doesn't have that's to be good. the guy on stage. No. He's the guy in the golf cart, bro, yeah. driving every week with that's a smile, good. greeting people. So I think the first thing, young guns, the first thing you're looking for mm -hmm. is faithfulness. I love that. What would you add to that? When you are faithful, everybody knows it. I would add that, right? Like you, every church you go to and you say, hey, who are the faithful men here? You're going to hear the same two or three names from everybody. That's real. Right? Because there's, there's a reputation. There's an example. And uh, so when I'm thinking about those characteristics, I, I think of the story in Acts chapter 6. And, and the church is going through a time of division. There, there's some prejudice, there's some favoritism, and, and it's leading to some division. There's some people unhappy with it. And it all came down to this one ministry they had where they were trying to get food to widows. And some of the widows were getting food and some were being neglected. So they go to the leaders of the church, they tell them the problem, and the leaders say, okay, well, we got this ministry over here, so we're going to keep running over here and doing that. But you need to find some men to do that. But they, they don't minimize it. They don't say, just find any guy to go do this. And That's remember, right. all they need are some men to pass out food. That's it. And they still say, those men need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with faith, 
and have a good reputation. Yeah. But just to even do that one ministry, they had to have a good reputation, be filled with faith, filled with the Holy Spirit. So when you're looking for someone to be that pace setter, someone to mentor you, disciple you, run with you, they got to be those faithful men, have that godly reputation. And again, it doesn't mean perfect. And, and find men who are filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, I got some guys right now that are helping lead our ministry. And they're, they're business-minded, they're smart, they're wise, they're successful. But the greatest asset they bring to our team, the greatest quality that I, I appreciate about them is they are prayerful men. Let's go. And that's one thing I would add is at, at, find some men who are on their knees in prayer. You. Yes. They're going to be willing to pray for you. I, uh, I had the privilege of introducing you at a conference a couple of weeks back. And remember, I talked about three types of men in my life. Mm. There are men that when I'm with them, yeah, I don't really grow. Mm. I'm just there for a good time. Mm. Right? Doesn't make them bad men. Doesn't yeah. make me a bad guy. But there's really no growth. I mean, we're probably either peers or on the same level, or they would even detract from mm. my growth. But I like being with them. Yeah, they're fun. Yeah, I'm gonna watch a game, eat some wings, sure. have a good time. Sure. Right. There are then those men that I don't like being around. But they help me grow. Yeah, you might need it. I can think of a couple of preachers today. I'm not going to name any names. Mm. I can't stand to listen to them. Mm. But, man, every time I do listen to them, I'm walking away. Yeah. Walking away better. It convicts you. gets you. That's it. But then there's those guys that you love being with. Mm. But every time you're with them, you grow. Mm. And you those, get both. Those, that's it. And you're, you're, one, of those, you're mm. one of those guys for me, man. I love being with you when I'm with you. I grow, and that's that's what you need to look for. Yeah. Who are those people in your life that you enjoy being around, oh, and yeah. they enjoy being around you? Yes, yes. And when you're with them, man, you're becoming more like King Jesus. Which is a principle we see in Scripture is that their faithfulness, their walk with Christ blesses you. There's, there's yeah. a proverb in Proverbs 20, verse 7. It paints this picture of a righteous man, and because he's righteous, because he's faithful, it says his children are blessed. It's it. Right, it's that ripple effect that everything God's pouring into us overflows out of us and blesses those around us. Come on. And so you, yeah, you surround yourself with faithful men, godly men, prayerful men. It's gonna bless you. That's right. You know, so yeah, find those men you enjoy and hanging out with. If find those men you. that challenge you. Yes, right? and that's that's a principle for life. And we do this principle. Yeah. Right. We just never equate it to the spiritual. Mm. Like it's the reason someone goes to university because you're gonna learn from someone that knows more than you. Oh yeah. If the university professor knew what you knew, they oh, yeah. wouldn't be the professor. Right. And you wouldn't pay money to go there. Right. When you're at a gym and you get a personal trainer, you don't hire a personal trainer that's less in shape than you are. <laughs> that's right. That would that's make right. no sense. Right. Some overweight guy telling you how to get in shape. That's that wouldn't right. make sense. Right? You want no. someone who's done it. You want someone that you want to look like. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I want those muscles. Because then you know if you got in there, you know how to get there. That's you can it. tell me how to get there. That's it. And and man, if I want to bench 250 pounds, yeah. I need to start hanging out with guys that bench 250 pounds. Yeah. And eventually You'll do it. I'm gonna level we'll up. Be there. It's on. the same thing spiritually. If you want to grow in holiness, mm. if you want to grow in prayer, if you want to grow in in godliness and leading your family well, yeah. you've got to surround yourself at least with one, yes. preferably two or three men that are there. Yeah, that you want to level up to. You got someone who's sharpening you. The iron sharpens iron. That we read about in Proverbs, and you know, hopefully, young men can find that in their home. Right. They'll find a father who pours into them, maybe a grandfather who's discipling them. But I know you can find it in healthy churches. In healthy churches, there are godly men there. And sometimes it's just being bold even to ask. I, say, hey. I, I got saved at 18. At 19, I knew I needed a mentor. I needed a pace setter. Everything we're talking about, I knew I needed. I made a list of six faithful men. Six men filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with prayer. Six faithful men, righteous men, not perfect guys. The guys, like you said, it's that personal trainer. I, I could see you've gotten there. Yeah. You're chasing Christ. You love Jesus. It's genuine. Your faith is real. And I made a list of those six men. I prayed over it for about six weeks. Come on. And then the Lord kept leading me to this one guy, and I called him on the phone, and I asked him. I just said, hey, listen, I gave my life to Christ a year ago. I, I need a pace setter. I need a mentor. I need someone to disciple me. I said, would you pray about disciple me? Here's what he said, though. 
and this is for those older men who've been running the race for a while, I would challenge you on this. He said, Jonathan, I don't need to pray about discipling you because I've been praying for three months that God would send me a younger man to disciple. Let's go. Like he had been praying that prayer. God had prepped his heart, prepared him for that phone call. And so to the younger men, whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, if right now you're saying, I need a pay setter, I need someone that I can look up to and run with, then, then go pray over the faithful men and go ask one of them. Yeah. And those of you who know I've been running the race well for a while now, but I don't have an answer to that question, who am I passing my baton of faith down to? Then you start praying, God, send me someone. And you initiate the conversation. Absolutely. I just... um I was sharing a little bit of this at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and a guy came up to me afterwards, and he said, hey, um, I want a pace setter. Mm. I want someone to follow. He said, but what if there's no one in my church to do it? Yeah. And I said, if, I said, if you're telling me there's no one in your church to do that, it's one of two things. Either you're looking at the wrong metrics, mm. and you don't know how to recognize faithfulness. Yeah. Or you're going to the wrong church. Yeah, if it's it, one of the if two. You can't find anything. Go find another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're either looking for the wrong thing. Yeah. And if if that's not it, if there really are no faithful men in your church, then yeah. go find another church. Yeah. You right? need you need that example somewhere. A hundred percent. But but to your point, let's talk about so so that's the younger man putting his mm-hmm. hand up and saying, "Hey, I need a pace setter. Yeah. I'm ready to run the race. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Older men at the same time. Don't wait for these younger men to come to you. Yeah, go reach out. Right? That that 70-year-old retired pipe fitter with a sixth-grade education, when I walked through the door of the church, he turned and looked at me and said, Son, you have the countenance of the Lord on you. Wow. I said, Bro, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> like, he could have insulted me for all I know. <laughs> and he said, Do you know what God wants from you? And I, I remember the conversation like it was yesterday. Mm. He said, you know what God wants from you? I said, no. He said, he desires obedience before sacrifice. <sighs> Do you know where that's at? I said, no. I didn't know Samuel existed. Yeah. I didn't know the first, yeah. second book of Samuel existed. He said, let me show you where it's at. Right there. And then from that day on, he was like my best friend. And he got you in the Word. And that's one of the marks of the discipleship is someone who will open up the Word of God with you. That's it. Teach you Scripture. You know, when Jesus gave us the commandment to go make disciples, at the heart of that was he said, teach them to obey my words. And so to the older guy, the seven-year-old pipe fitter who needs to be discipling someone, like you said, don't wait. And when you do start that relationship, one, you got to run close to them. That's it. All right, that proximity. And two, you got to open up the Word of God. You, you got to open up the Scriptures and, and teach them, what does the Bible say about you as a young man? What does the Bible say about your identity, about your sin, about your need for Jesus Christ? What does it say about the hope you can find in Christ? You know, teach them the gospel. And then you're, you're going to walk with them through everything they're walking through. Through life. Yes. Through life. And look for those moments. He, Don used to... He asked me to come cut his grass on Saturday morning, mm. right? He was getting older. You know, it's hot. He didn't yeah. need to be out in the heat. And at first I was annoyed by it. Mm. You know, he had grandsons. He had other people. Why was he asking me? Yeah. Right? But I did it. I mean, it was my fiance's grandfather. Yeah, he's going to let you marry his granddaughter. I mean, go mow his for, yard. <laughs> for, that, for that reason alone, right? Yeah. She's spicy. I'm in there, right? <laughs> so I'm going, to, I'm going to cut the grass. Um, but then two months into that, man, I started looking forward to going to cut the grass. Why? Because I began to pick up. He was always, every Saturday, he would teach me a new lesson. That's so good. He would teach me something new. He was using those moments to yeah. disciple me. I love and that. And then I'd get on his roof, and I'd clean out his gutters, and and he showed me how to do that. And he was literally teaching me That's so good. Um, how not just how to be a godly man, but how to be a man-man. It's like Mr. Miyagi, right, and the Karate Kid. Bro, why so young- this young man's got this mentor, and he thinks he's just having to do chores, paint his fence That's for him. It. But he knew later. He found out. Oh, you know, you're teaching me what I need to know. You know, for that is about karate, like, martial like, why, arts. Why am I waxing this 1956 <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Ford F-150? He's like, I'll teach you how <laughs> wax, wax off, wax off, <laughs> wax off. <laughs> oh, yeah. you, we all need that, right? We like, need a we Mr. Need Miyagi, Mr. Miyagi mentor, who even just doing. Chores around the house. That's it. it. It's growing us into the men we need to be. So, you know? so older men hear us say, you don't have to wait. Yeah. 
Man, those it, I, I I describe it like this, and I heard I heard actually I didn't describe it like this. I heard David Chase say this one time. He says it's like an awkward middle school dance. Mm. You remember you remember your old middle school dance? Oh, all yeah. the boys would stand over here. All the girls would stand over here. We, we would just end up playing basketball in the other gym. That's right. And maybe <laughs> if Vanilla Ice, Ice Ice Baby, come on, you would dance. That in was my song. I would dance. <laughs> I think. I think if that came on today, I would probably start dancing. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And Van Winkle or whatever his name was. <laughs> Van Rob Van Winkle. Rob Van Winkle, Winkle yeah. If you're hearing this, we'd love to have you on the show. Yeah, to he's talk a about Dallas Van guy. Him. Come on. Is he? Originally. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's because I think he told everybody he's from Miami. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he went so, to like LD Bell High School. That's right. That's right. So discipleship is like this awkward eighth grade dance. Yeah. You've got all the old men over here. Mm. And all and 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 let me put this caveat in here. The church has done that to itself. Mm. So for every and I and for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. Cool. Like I believe in physics. Sure. Right. Come on. So with the whole life group movement. So there was a time, and J.T. English, our buddy, yeah, right, writes about this. Deep Discipleship. That's it, Deep Discipleship. Phenomenal book. If you haven't Love read it, it, read it. He writes about that transition where churches moved from academic spaces to communal spaces. Mm. Right? It was all about community. And there was good things. Sure. Community groups, life groups, good yeah. things. But what we did systematically is we began to segregate the church by life stage. Mm. So we put all the 20-year-olds over here, told yeah. them to hang out. We put all the 70-year-olds over here and gave them some demeaning name like Silver Sneakers or something like that. It's <laughs> terrible the names we give these things. And, and, and we basically cut off any type of generational experience and wisdom being transferred. Yeah, we, yeah, we ended up with, uh, I saw it at a coffee shop one time here in the DFW area. I walked in, I saw some young college students hanging out. I saw a married couple with some young kids over here. And I saw this older group of guys drinking coffee. In it. one coffee shop, you had it, all the generations, but they weren't communicating with each other at all. No. You're Like you said, that awkward dance on different sides of the room, and that's what we see in the churches. You might have all the generations there on Sunday morning, that's right. but there's no mentorship, generational discipleship taking place. Yeah, we got to pull them out of the silos, right? Yes. And we've got to understand that wisdom and experience is largely transferred down. Oh yeah. I got yeah. invited. I got called, and they wanted me to come speak at a youth conference one time. Mm. I I thought it was a youth conference. It was a youth pastor's conference. Mm. So I'm, I'm getting ready for this, and I'm like, hey, what do you want me to teach on? They're like, whatever the Spirit leads, which is typically not good for me. It gets me into trouble. <laughs> but um, I preached. I did two. They had me scheduled for two sessions. Yeah. And I, I did a 30,000-foot Proverbs, mm. okay, just unpacking Proverbs. That's good. And I taught how Proverbs – Age is associated with wisdom. Mm -hmm. You see that throughout Proverbs. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, in biblical times, you weren't considered wise until you turned 40 oh, because yeah. you had lived enough yep. and you had typically by then suffered some kind of loss, which wisdom came through a sure. loss. Yeah, that's a gray hair, right? Gray yeah, hair a was bit a gray sign hair. of it. wisdom. And, yeah. and by the way, which is why they were amazed every time Jesus taught. Because he was young. Because he was young. And he spoke with authority. And wisdom. wisdom. They're like, who is this? Yeah. That he knows all these things. He was 30 years old and hadn't done anything. Come on. Right? So if Proverbs teaches that, and it does, I challenge you, hundreds of verses. Yeah. Proverbs also teaches the opposite. Mm. Youthfulness is associated with foolishness. Mm. Right? So I know I, my youth was. That's it. Yeah. So I asked the question at the conference. It's interesting today in a lot of churches we have the fools leading the fools. Mm, now, like the blind leading the blind. Needless the fools to say, the fools. needless to say, they didn't ask me back week for the second one. <laughs> they didn't like that. No, no. <laughs> Apparently, everyone in the crowd was under the age of twenty-four. <laughs> but and they didn't have. It, I will say, if they all had godly mentors, they would have nodded along. They would have amened everyone because they would have known the value of that wisdom. That's it. But. But again, every aspect of life, we want this. When you look for someone to roof your house, yeah. you're looking for someone with 20 years experience. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. want experience. Why? Because experience and wisdom are typically transferred down. That's so good. We've cut that off today. Yeah. We've got to get back. You said it, bro. We've got to get back to multi-generational discipleship. Oh, yeah. And I'm all for, like you said, community. But 100%. JT English says it this way. He goes, if you aim for a community, you might get discipleship. 
But if you aim for genuine discipleship, you always get community. Because in genuine discipleship, you're running close enough to pass that baton. Paul says it in 1 Thessalonians 2.8 in the scriptures. He says, we didn't just share the gospel with you. We shared our very lives with you. That's right. Right? But we, we start with community and hope that discipleship follows Instead of let's start with generational discipleship, and you're going to have generational community. That bro, It'd that's be amazing. That's beautiful. So if you're listening to this, that's so good. If you're listening to this today, you you, you don't have to wait for your church to do this. Like yeah. you don't have to wait for your pastor to stand on stage and say, "Hey guys, we've got a multi generational discipleship strategy that we're about to pass down." Yeah, start mentoring. Right. Go. Just right now. Yeah. Find a younger man. Yeah. And say, hey. Uh, would you like me to invest in you? That's good. Or, hey, would you like me to run alongside of you? That's or, good. hey, I've learned a few things in my 50 years. Yeah. I'd love to pass a few things on to you. Oh, These yeah. young men, it's like water on a desert. Mm. They will drink it in and then start to do life with them. So I want to lay out. I want to lay out a path, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. In the last episode, we talked about that path. If you don't, if you don't present a path, right, the world the world will present one. Yeah, if these older men don't disciple the younger men, the world is already discipling them. Yeah, so what's this What's this discipleship path? I call it an ancient path. It's Mm -hmm. right in Scripture. I love that. We're not redefining it. We're not inventing anything new. We're just reclaiming it. Yeah. Step one is invite a young man into a multi-generational discipleship relationship. Yeah. Whether that's you or a group of older men. It doesn't have to be one to one. It yeah. can be one to three. It can be it can be two on two. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, my wife right? right now has three senior girls in high school that she meets with once a week to disciple them. I love it. Love yeah. it. Step one. Step two is give them a vision for manhood and masculinity. <sighs> Come on. You can't remember what we said last week. You can't become what you can't define. Yeah, define it biblically. That's it. Lay what, it out. What does the scripture say about a young man? What does the scripture say about Biblical manhood. That's right. So lay out this vision of what it means to be God's man. That's step good. two. Step one, invite him into the relationship. Step two, lay out the vision. Step three is enter into a season where you're challenging them to put to death childhood thinking. Paul said, uh, when I became a man, I stopped thinking and acting like a child. That's so. We, we were just talking to a young man today who gave us this example. A young man today said he had an older man, an older believer, challenge him That's right. to go spend four hours so, in the woods without his phone yeah. and just with his Bible. That's he, it. he was challenged to put down this worldly thing that we all yep. carry around, take up his Bible, and, and go have some time of solitude, time alone with the Lord, we got to have men challenging young men that way. The number one, when I'm counseling um, married couples whose whose marriage is falling apart, yeah, okay, the number one thing I hear from the wife mm. is that um, I thought I had married a man when in reality I had just married a boy. Oh, man. It's the number one thing I hear. That hits. Because they have not put to death childhood thinking. They have not put to death childhood actions. Yeah. They haven't put it to death yet. You just carry those childish ways into a grown marriage, into an adult family, Yeah. and, and it hurts the yeah. family. It's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. Yeah. But you don't have the right tool. That's right. Well, James Dotson, he said, and he wrote this a few years ago, he said, our very survival as a people will be contingent on either the presence or the absence of spiritual men leading in the home. Let's go. Let's like, go. You take that away, everything falls apart. We, we saw that last episode. But on the flip side, if we could put that in, if That's everybody right. watching this all of a sudden is running the race with the mentor, run the race with someone that they're mentoring, Come on. you'll see radical revival yeah. and transformation. Listen, you can't be a boy playing a man's game. Yeah. You're going to lose That's every good. time. That will right. Step one. Invite them. Step two, define it. Step three, challenge them. It's time to put to death childhood thinking straight from the Apostle Paul. Mm. Step four is create an environment Mm. where they can follow you, where they can test their new skills, where they can learn, where it's safe to fail. That's good. Right? Yeah. But but they're being encouraged. They're being rebuked. Yeah. They're being strengthened. They're being challenged. Mm. And to your point, this has to be done in proximity. Yeah. You can't encourage, challenge, strengthen, and rebuke somebody from 20 yards away. And well, it, it, it's, it your, it's your mentor 
roofing a house with you, mowing the yard with you. It's my uh, youth pastor when I was a teenager needing more guidance than I can even describe, picking me up every morning in the summer at 5 a.m. and sitting on a rooftop with me all day roofing houses not because I knew anything about roofing. He didn't need me to roof that house. I slowed him down. That's I right. was dropping nails Come and hammers. I, I lost him money. I lost him time. So why in the world would he do that? Because he knew this young man needs proximity with a godly man, a pace setter, and I'm going to step up and be that for him. Bro, that's when years ago when I was pastoring a church, um, some of the elders came to me and they said, hey, we we recognize that you don't do anything by yourself. Hmm whether you're going to visit someone at the hospital, whether you're setting up chairs in the sanctuary, whether you're going to speak at a conference, you're always taking someone with you. That's so good. And there's two reasons I do that. Mm. One is because um, it's hard to be unholy in mm. a group of holy people. That's good. Right? So yeah, one, it's just a personal thing for me. Like I don't travel alone Yeah. because it's, it's, it's easier to sin when you're by yourself. Mm, that's right? good. But the second thing is, is because I'm always teaching. Yeah. When you look at Deuteronomy 6, and it talks about when you go to bed, when you rise, when you walk, when you lie mm -hmm. down. He's not He's not giving specific times of the day. Yeah. What he's doing is encompassing the whole day. He's saying yeah. from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, you are teaching. Yes. You already got these rhythms in your life. Invite someone into them. You're already running That's the it. race. Don't run alone. That's it. Don't run man. alone. Get someone running with you. That's it. They need it. You need it. And here's the secret, right, that you and I have learned is – when I'm discipling someone, I get just as much out of that as the person I'm discipling. And I've had my mentors tell me the same thing. Hey, look, Jonathan, when we get with you and we're pouring into you, it, it edifies me. That's why it says iron sharpens iron. They both leave sharp. That's, that's beautiful. So going from the top, invite them into a relationship. Define what a man is. Mm. Define what a man is. Challenge them to put to death childhood thinking and acting. Create a safe environment that they can both succeed and fail in. Mm. Encourage, challenge, rebuke, equip. And then lastly, maybe the p most important step, when they have passed the test, mm. you have to affirm and celebrate that. That's so good. You have to pull that young man aside or pull him up in front of other men and say, hey, it That's is so time good. for you to take your rightful place in the world. Call that. it the Father's blessing. Call it a um, commissioning. Call yes. it whatever you want to call yes. it. Um, Robert Lewis talked about knighting the knight, right? Give him a sword. I don't care what. Some people give a pocket knife. It's time oh, yeah. for you to take. But what you're communicating to that man is you're no longer a drain on the world. Yeah. You're affirming, I have seen the Lord work. See I've seen, I was with, two nights ago, I was with a 60-year-old missionary from, from Europe. 60 years old. He's been following Christ for 40 years. He's been in ministry for 40 years. And you know what story he was telling me? He was telling me about his mentor, who's now in his 70s, who still disciples him, still mentors him. And he told me after years of mentorship, when he was being commissioned to go and serve as a missionary, his mentor gave him a Bible. And in the front of the Bible, he said, I no longer call you the young man that I'm discipling. I, I call you my friend, my peer. We've been running the race Come together. On. He's 60 now. 40 years later, he still has that Bible. 40 years later, he's still quoting that. 40 years later, that is still what means everything to him because he had the affirmation from the man who was discipling him. Brother, so you know that um, at Better Man, I replaced Robert Lewis. Yeah. that That's not a small <laughs> deal. Yeah. Right. I mean, he's one of the giants in the men's ministry oh, yeah. movement. Yeah. Right. And I, you know, to some degree, I've probably always not wrestled with that, but like that, that looms there. Mm -hmm. Like I'm the guy after Robert Lewis. Yeah. Sure. Right. So a week or so ago, I was teaching at this, at this event. And I get done and one of, one of, a guy that I consider a mentor pulled me aside and he said, Hey, I want you to know for years I learned from Robert. Mm. and I considered Robert the expert. Mm. He said, tonight, I want you to know I've learned from you, and you're the expert. Oh, what I on. got from Robert, I got from you, and come I just on. wanted to encourage you. Bro, that one compliment, yeah. I could run for the next 10 years oh, on that one world. compliment, right? And I know, I know I'm not the end all be all, and I know, you know I'll probably never – impact or reach yeah. as many people as Robert Lewis. That's not the point. Right. That's not the point. Yes. Right. 
the fact that he said that and encouraged me with that, yeah. Yeah. it was almost like, it was almost like I've arrived. Like, sure. like I, I've now taken my rightful place in the space, oh, my yeah. rightful place in the ministry, and I'm going to be able to run twice as hard, twice as fast That's right. because of that affirmation. I wonder how many young men, oh man, how many young men, if they would just receive that affirmation, oh, yeah. just receive that mantle, just yes. receive that blessing, that they would actually step into the role God's called them into. Yes, because what they do receive all day, every day, is the world telling them who they are. 100%. The, the world is good at that. The world will tell them who they are, but a lot of times, you know, it, it's putting them down, it's breaking them down, or even when it's somewhat trying to encourage them, it's with this worldly label that isn't helpful. And, and so these young men, all day, every day, are being defined by the world around them. They're finding their identity in the world but to have a godly man who affirms them. One author said the three greatest things that kids need from their fathers are actually the three greatest things that are missing in the home today. And he said it's this attention, your time, right? Affection, your actual love, and affirmation. Come on. Encouraging words. I believe in you. Yes, I believe in you. The, the three things they, they need the most are the three things they're not getting. And so what do they do? They, they don't just say, well, never mind. I guess I don't need that. They take that need to the world and they say, well, then you give me your attention. You give me your affection and you give me your affirmation. Come on. And they go find it from the world. And the consequences of that are devastating as we highlighted last time. Some of you older men need to hear that again. If you're not giving the attention, the affection, the affirmation to these younger men, they're going to go to the world to get it which is why we're in the situation we're in. They've already gone to the world, and, and the world's given them so much time. The Gosh. world's given them some kind of worldly version of love, and the world has defined them. Listen to us. You wanted the path, we're giving it to you. Yeah, there it This is. is the path. By the way, this is also the second half of our state of manhood, Yeah, which you can check out. It's out. It's yeah. phenomenal. But this is the path. You've got to enter into a multi-generational relationship. Mm -hmm. You've got to define what it means to be God's man. Mm. You've got to create. You've got to. You've got to challenge that young put man away. to put to death childhood thinking. Create a space that he can test his new skills. Yes, and then affirm him. Affirm him. Come on, go we'll run the race. Start yeah. running. We change the world. Yeah, one man at a time. I love it, brother. Love being with you. Hey, you too, Art. See you next week. <laughs>